What's up everyone, this is Darius Klobarczyk, co-founder of NG Poland, JS Poland, AngularMaster.dev and WorkshopFest.dev. Welcome back to the Angular Master podcast. Today we've got a special guest from Warsaw, Poland, independent consultant and software architect, speaker, trainer and co-founder of Architectura na Froncie. Ladies and gentlemen, Tomasz Ducin. Hi, Tomek. How are you? Hi, Darek. I'm fine. Thank you for having me here today. How are you? Thank you. I'm great. So for those who don't know you yet, please tell us about yourself. I'm an independent consultant and uh, developer, uh, architect and a trainer as well. So I specialize in JavaScript technologies, mainly that is um, like JavaScript, obviously, TypeScript, uh, React, Angular and uh, related uh, tech. Um, I used to be just a, a member of a development team and a team lead later on. But right now, I'm a consultant who help um, many different companies and their products to uh, remove obstacles or to improve uh, in the area of performance, architecture, design, um, micro frontends also, uh, testing, and various other uh, features. I also uh, train development teams on new technology. So, for instance, if you have um, backend developers and you need to walk into either Angular, React, or um, you don't feel confident with testing, or you feel like that you put some effort into testing and that basically, like, you don't have confidence that, like, you sh- you get the you know the output that you expect, etc. Um, yeah, I help in such in such. Um, situations. So if you're interested in consulting or uh, trainings, I'm here to help. Tomek, why should Angular developers care about another state management library? Well, indeed, there are like a couple of um, popular tools for state management in Angular, though um, comparing to React ecosystem, I think that there is uh, one aspect, one topic, one area that is quite yet not un- not handled uh, well as it should be, like well enough. And that is synchronizing the server state with what we have in our client applications. So the state management tools that we have, they mostly focus on managing the local state and they are absolutely good with this. But when it comes to loading the data from the server and uh, making them available on the client, it seems that existing solutions introduce quite a lot of overhead or boilerplate, and it's somehow like expensive to implement. It's quite cumbersome to 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 get, and this could be done in a way more convenient, cheaper, and faster way. But not like cheaper in terms of you know <clears throat> do less but actually use a specialized tool that would be, you know, um, extremely good at doing only one thing. So not overgeneralized, not, you know, want to fit them all, but specifically, you know, tailored for the need of uh, synchronizing your server state with the client. So um, why should they care about yet another state management library? Because it's specialized for doing one thing, but it does the thing very, very well. Angular query is a part of React query. There are also ports for other frameworks. Are they popular in the ecosystems? I can speak for uh, React query because I'm not that much into Vue and Svelte. Though in um, in React uh, ecosystem, React query is like super, super, super popular. So of course, everybody knows Redux. But I would say that apart from Redux itself, uh, whether we are speaking about the, let's say, all the Redux or the new Redux toolkit, um, React Query is, I would say, absolutely number one, except for Redux. But again, it's difficult to measure whether Redux is um, popular for because of being popular for almost a decade already, or like you know how many people would choose Redux today. But React Query is um, picked very, very, very often in new products and new projects, new systems. Because like like I said, you write very little code 
a lot of the things are done underneath. So one task is done very well. What is an application state? How would you define it? Well, that's a very general question. Application state is actually any data that you would like to process, display, use, uh, make interactive, like um, anything that you want to actually you know, run could be defined as related to state. Everything that you want to click, anything that you want to display could be, you know, uh, or, or could could originate in application state um, in some way. So <clears throat> there might be some application state that gets created by the user as the user um, interacts with your application. But there is also a lot of state that basically is fetched from an external data source, whether that is a database or um, any other cloud um, infrastructure uh, element that basically feeds your um, application with with the data to be displayed to be used by the by the user. So um, you could say that basically, except for the templates, pretty much everything is more or less to some extent application state. So um, yeah, I, I think it's it's very important to. Um, to use the tools for 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 state management that um, are kind of you know play very well with how you work with the data with the nature of the data because application state could be different. Do all applications need state? I would say, like mostly, yeah. If as long as we are speaking about non-trivial applications, um, or even if you have trivial applications like I don't know calculator or a tic tac toe game, you. Pretty much always when you need to display something or allow the user to, to, to interact with the page, like you will have some form of the of the state. So I would say, yeah. And um, recently I uh, saw a very nice quote which said that, uh, <laughs> that would be a slightly modified quote, that application state is something that you will have to do anyway. But if you don't, do that explicitly don't manage it explicitly it will be left unmanaged but if the you know application state is unmanaged it does mean that it doesn't exist it is there though it basically gets chaotic so um yeah i would say all applications do uh, do need some some form of state management and yeah pick wisely whatever tools you want to to uh, to utilize What is so specific about Angular query that makes it worth learning it? The most specific thing is that Angular query kind of doesn't care about your local state. So, for instance, if you want to fill a form and send the the form uh, data uh, via HTTP post to the server, so Angular query doesn't care about what has the cli- uh, the, the user uh, typed in, what has the user clicked through, etc. Angular query cares only about the data that you fetch, and it tries to manage the data um, as much as, as as it can. So you know, sharing, refreshing, reloading, prefetching, making sure that you don't display stale data. You know, the data that could be too old, outdated. Um, try to uh, do lots of things, lots of timers, measuring the time. When should things get refreshed? When should things get invalidated, etc. Or, for instance, when you create a new element, that perhaps the list uh, that you have fetched with HTTP GET could get like you should update it. Maybe you want to update it locally. Maybe you want to do a hard reload to the server anyway. So, Angular query makes it. Very easy and React query as well, of course, makes it very easy to handle your um, server data on the client. So do as little as you uh, as you need to, but it provides all the standard features that you might want. For instance, um, yeah, data sharing, data fetching, preloading, refreshing, and so on and so forth. So these are um, very standard requirements. That you um, that you need to support. Also, if you make a request, you need to make uh, and you need to display the data. You need to make sure that the data has been already received, so that you don't start, let's say, your Angular 
um, fetching stream with an empty array because, you know, an empty array could represent, let's say, querying for the elements that, well, some, you know, some filtering that basically you get an empty result set. But it's a totally different if you have, it's a totally different uh, situation if you have a uh, correct um, filtering result, which is basically empty because no elements with name, let's say, ABC have been found. And a totally different situation if your initial uh, data set basically doesn't exist because you have never received yet uh, a response, right? So Angular Query also tries to figure out such low-level details um, using TypeScript uh, union union types and all the type narrowing that uh, TypeScript allows us to do so that small, um, small um, low-level bugs uh, are more difficult to, <laughs> to basically introduce to your application. So that um, Angular query will force you to make an if statement here and there so that you don't walk into a troublesome situation. So again, this is all tailored to uh, to the most standard situations where you fetch data when it comes to you know listings, tables, uh, grids, and these kind of uh, features. You are now listening to the Angular Master Podcast by Angie Poland. Listen, code, repeat. All you need to know to become a super Angular developer. Make sure to hit the subscribe button and drop us a cool comment. And don't miss out our second show, the JavaScript Master Podcast, where you find tons of fantastic JavaScript topics. Many people are familiar with NGRX and Redux in general. How do these compare? So whether um, NGRX or Redux, they... Uh, so NGRX and Redux, uh, it's actually pretty much almost the same architecture. Um, there, you can define an action which um, represents something that... There, you can define an action that represents something that has happened in your application. So that might be an action caused by the user. So for instance, user wanted to remove an element or user wanted to add or modify an element or um, maybe there is some action happening in the browser. For instance, time has passed and there should be some consequence of the of the uh, you know passage of time or that um, there is a response or event taking place somewhere in the browser, etc. But generally, Redux and NGRX doesn't care where does your event come from, what do you represent. It's a multi-purpose tool. And the thing is, if you want to, let's say, handle um, some forms or some local state in NGRX or Redux, you can basically think about whatever actions you need to come up with. You can define any payload that you want. You can bring any reducer. Like, you can do pretty much everything. Now, could you use NGRX and Redux for data fetching from the server? Of course you could. But if we think about it, like, most of the times, I would say 99% of the use cases, what you get is um, you need to fetch some data from the server, which could be there, or which you don't have yet because you're still loading, or the third option, that an error has happened. Like, basically, like the equivalent of the classical try-catch finally. Uh, approach. And the thing is, why would you repeat over and over again the, you know, fetch users um, loading or uh, users loaded success, user loading failure, and then the same for projects, the same for budgets, the same for offices, like, you know, repeating everything over and over and over and over again. Now, if you want to do sharing the data, then you need to come up with selectors. If you want to refresh the data in the background, you would need to, for instance, in EdgeRx, you would need to uh, come up with streams that would measure the time to figure out, like, when should you potentially update the thing? You need, you would need to also measure uh, how many components are actually interested in displaying or consuming in uh, the other way, consuming the data that you have in the store. So this is something that you, like, you would need to put some effort to do this. And now. Um, NGRX or Redux is not doing this by default because they can't, um, like these tools cannot um, assume that this is your use case. And in Angular Query, the, um, the area of responsibility is very, very narrow. 
just for the data fetching and um, consuming the data within the components. So Angular Query, you could you could think of it as a way, in a way that it can make some assumptions uh, when it comes to how are you going to uh, use the data because it relates only to data fetching. So we know that um, potentially your data could get stale, outdated. So you might need to refresh it. Um, when you change the data locally, maybe you would like to invalidate the, 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 the query that you have just made so that you would have to refetch the data from the server again. Um, maybe you would also like to make sure that uh, whenever you have loaded some data and you have walked to a different tab within your application and you move back to the previous tab, then you do have some data right, that you could display. And for instance, something that um, Angular Query is doing is called SWR, stale while revalidate. So what the pattern is doing is you might have the old data in your cache and now the user would already see the old data and in the background, you'd basically refetch. And if the refetch is successful, basically what the user can see is that the old data would be replaced by the new data. And the point is, you don't need to do anything with it. Everything is handled automatically. So, of course, you could have, you know, lots of plugins for NGRX, for Redux, you know, middlewares, meta reducers, whatever we call them, like, of course. But the thing is, this tool is specifically done to handle this uh, standard uh, scenario. So I would say the biggest difference between anything that is Redux related is that it's a multi-purpose tool and it cannot be, you know, highly specialized in doing one single task because if something is, you know, multi-purpose, then you cannot make too many assumptions. What you could do is provide basically a um, a tool that is built on top of that. On the other hand, Angular Query is trying to do one thing, solve one problem, but do it very well. And thanks to being narrowed, it can be very specific It and it can come up with, you know, lots and lots of features that you don't even need to be aware of because lots of things are basically being handled for you <laughs> anyway. Is it a good idea for an application to use Angular Query with other state management tools? In general, does it make sense to use multiple tools within one application? I would say yes. Like one of the, if you ask different people, different people would say, would, would answer the, the question in a different way. I think um, it is okay. So one thing that could be a concern is that Redux claims that it uh, is the single source of truth. So that Redux should be the only source for the state within your application. Because if Redux provides you with um, uh, very nice debugging, middlewares that basically can process all the data that you have in your application, um, that it can time travel, it could um, do hot reloading, and so on and so forth. So everything that you basically move away from Redux, move out of it, then you lose those features. So for instance, if you take one thing out from Redux, it's it will not be processed by the middlewares or the meta reducers. It will not be available within your time traveling. It will not be available without within you know any, for instance, synchronizing your Redux state with local storage, whatever. So everything that you move away from Redux is going to be unavailable for all these tools that make Redux awesome, Redux architecture awesome. Um, however, the question is, for instance, in terms of um, synchronizing your state with local storage, um, on one hand, let's say if you open an application and you have a very big form with, I know, 50 different form controls, if you type in your data and you were not able to finish submitting your form, you close the application and you open it the next day, I think it would be quite useful for you to basically get the state of your form back when you open the application back because it would be very useful. So it does make sense to synchronize your local state with, for instance, local storage. However, if you load some data from the server, would it make sense to basically get a snapshot from your server from a certain point in time and save it in local storage? Like, I don't think that would be very useful because that's a, you know, it's a snapshot 
of an old data and you're going to load that data from the server, you know, the fresh response anyway. So what makes perfect sense in terms of client state doesn't necessarily make, you know, a lot of sense when it comes to server state. So um, so from on one hand, Redux claims it is the only source of truth, but if you draw a very clear boundary between your client state and your server state, I would say, yeah, it does make sense to to mix them. So theoretically, people could um, kind of, you know, raise the concern and complain that, hey, Redux should be the only source of the state in your application. On one hand, yes, but I would say on the other hand, like, you know, all the extreme um, paradigms, extreme decisions that you make, they actually narrow you down. For instance, if you use a tool that, like, for instance, Angular signals, they don't say, like, whether you should have one big signal or super smaller signals. Like, smaller, lots of smaller signals are going to be more performant in your application and more scalable, like, more convenient to use, etc. But they actually, they, they doesn't force you to do anything. So how many options do you have to change your decisions in the future? Like, lots of options. Because they don't narrow you down. And, on the other hand, Redux claiming that it will always be the single and only source of truth, only source of state, this kind of narrows um, down your decisions in the future and narrows down your flexibility so significantly that at some point, like, you know, uh, it, it, can, it, it becomes very, very limited. For instance, if you wanted to choose a, a tool, for instance, for managing state machines, um, like XState in Angular, in React, whatever, and you have React, and uh, and, and, sorry, and you have Redux, then there would be a concern, again, that Redux is claiming I am the only one and you would like to choose X state because this is the more most robust tool for managing uh, state machines. Then, like, you, you know, like there is a limitation that um, that should not take place there, right? Because you would like each tool to do its perfect job. And this, you know, this limitation that Redux claims this is the only source of truth is kind of really, really um, invasive. So I would say, yeah, we are kind of breaking the rule, but since we are drawing the boundary between the client and the server state very, very clearly, I would say, yeah, this is finally, this is absolutely okay. And let's not make a very, you know, extreme decisions that certain tool will always remain the single source of truth for, you know, for forever, for entire application, because we basically don't know what the future is going to be. We don't know what will change. So making such, you know, invasive and extreme decisions could narrow down our, you know, flexibility in the future. And this is, from architecture perspective, it's not very good to <laughs> to have very little, you know, <laughs> flexibility. Um, so, yeah. I would say if you remove data fetching and data uh, data uh, well, sorry, server data synchronization from, from Redux, absolutely, yeah. So tell us more about the query concept. Is a pattern or a building block? How does it work? The query is the central and the core concept uh, within Angular Query, just as the, as the name suggests. So basically, when you um, shoot an HTTP request, let it be HTTP GET, or a collection, or an item, or HTTP POST, whatever that is, you can think of it in different, let's say, ways. For instance, if you shoot the fetch, native uh, browser native fetch request, then you can think of it as a request that is being sent from the client to the server, and the server builds the re prepares the response and sends the response back to the client. So there is basically a moving piece. Now, you could think of it as a different thing. Um, if you have a RxJS stream that whenever there is something on the upstream that would make a switch map or a merge map, whatever, and then uh, there is a request being sent to the server, which is kind of reactive depending on whatever happens in the upstream, you could think of it as a flow that, let's say, whenever the user types something into the um search, input, search, filter, whatever, uh, then there would be a refreshed query, a uh, refreshed request to the server. You could think of it as a flow that whatever is typed in the input to the input in the form is 
being um, kind of uh, mapped to a request that is then being sent to the server. Like it's a flow. So it's not a command. It's not a request, but it's a flow. Now a query is again, HTTP, but, or it does have to be HTTP, but most of the time it is HTTP. Um, you can think of it as a dependency of a component. So you define that you do have an ACP resource, let it be, I know, api.com slash users, and you have a list of users. And if you create a use uh, inject query um, on your Angular component, then you define that this component that you have right here right now depends on the data uh, that is available somewhere externally. And this is all that you do. So query is highly declarative. And whenever the component becomes, we say it active, but basically whenever the component is live, it's being basically uh, displayed and you know created, rendered, etc. then the query will figure out, okay, so there is a query that have never been fetched yet, or at least it is not cached. It is not present in our cache, but there is at least one active subscriber that requires this data to have so that I will basically pick up whatever the function is to do the request. I will do the request, like me, I mean React query or Angular query. I will do the request, cache the, resp uh, the response, and uh, whenever any component, uh, any new component will basically uh, notify me that, hey, I am interested in this exact query, then I will first look it up in the cache. So that think of a query as a dependency that is being automatically fetched, uh, sorry, uh, shared uh, across many different uh, components uh, within your application. And also what uh, Angular Query is doing is that it's tracking the the time, like when have you fetched the data and how, many, uh, how much time has passed since then. Um, you define... Um, what is the amount of time in which you consider this data to be kind of uh, up to date and um, what amount of time would have to pass so that we uh, consider this um, this data entry in the cache as stale so that whenever there would be a new component who would like to reuse the data from the cache, um, what Angular query or React query would do is that it would basically send this data like it would it would inject the the data to the to the component but uh in the background it would also refresh the data of course when the refresh is uh done then all the timers would be reset accordingly etc so the only thing that you do basically is you configure for how many for instance seconds or milliseconds or minutes whatever for how long do you consider data to be fresh enough so that you don't have to reload it that's basically what you do. And you get all this, you know, sharing, refetching, um, reinvalidating, etc. You get it all for, for free. So um, one important concept here to add is uh, what is called a query key. So I don't want to make it very, very uh, technical, but um, let's say that you want to load uh, the data from api.com slash users. That basically means give me all the users like potentially limited to, I don't know, 100, uh, first 100 rows, whatever. But what if you would like to uh, fetch all the users which have a certain property set? Let's say that would be um, all users that have active subscription. Now you would do some server side filtering. And now api.com slash users and api.com slash users question mark, subscription equals true, is a different resource. And the, the thing is, how can we kind of identify the resources that we basically fetch? So um, everything that you fetch from the server should have a unique ID, and the ID is basically what we call the key. So uh, this is just an array of strings that could be hierarchical, um, that, you, have, you know, you might have a whole group of users, uh, queries, then there would be a, either a list of users or a detail of a certain user by ID, etc. So basically, you can uh, you put a string, then another string, another string like users, uh, comma, ID, comma, one. That basically means within the users um, resource, there is an ID or details subsection, 
And then there is a yet subsection of, of let's say, ID1, ID2, ID3, etc. And this way you identify which query is which. So that when a component is interested in a very certain data, very specific data, and another component is interested in a slightly different data, they don't mismatch. So think of the query key as an, as an ID. So a query, going back, is basically an um, expression of... Uh, declaring a dependency that a component depends on external data. So you just pass what the function to fetch the data is going to be used, but you don't run the function. It is Angular Query which will run the function for you when it decides to do. There is a lot of work being done behind the scenes by Angular Query, like invalidating, refetching, and so on. Could you describe what is the data flow what are the things developers should know and what are just implementation details irrelevant for most of us? The most important thing that we should be aware of is basically the, uh, <laughs> yeah, the data flow. So um, that there is some cache somewhere, the, the, the cache for the queries, but um, you will most of the time not uh, interact with the query cache or mutation cache at all. So what you might do, for instance, would be, for instance, destroying the cache entry or updating the cache entry or invalidating the cache entry. Though we don't interact with the cache uh, directly, we do it via the what is called a query client. There are two things that you need to know. There is the inject query, which basically declares the dependency, and there is a query client. So... A query client is something that you might use whenever you want to combine the query with what is called a mutation. I have mentioned this already, but let's just uh, remind that quickly. So if you load a list of users, let's say, uh, like fetch it via a query, and let's say you have 100 users, you click delete button on one of the users. So the thing is, you already know that a user has been deleted, uh, let's say that you have received the 200 OK response from the server, so you know that the uh, user uh, object, the user record has been successfully deleted. Now the question is, what should happen with the cached uh, list data uh, that describes your uh, your user's list? So you know that you used to have 100 objects, but now you have only 99. So what you should do? You should remove the entry from the cache entirely. You could mar uh, you could invalidate it. By invalidating, we mean make it stale immediately so that whenever there is a component that would like to display the list, it would have displayed the list, the, the old version, but in the background, immediately the data would get refetched. What you could do also would be um, hard refetching, which basically means um, we don't want to store the old data in the cache, so please refetch it right here, right now, imperatively. But what you could also do is that, well, you know, you've had 100 objects in the list and you removed, uh, let's say, um, object with ID 1, 2, 3, whatever that is. And what what you can do is basically take this query uh, a cache entry and update it by removing this object locally because you more or less know, like, well, there is one way to, to remove an object from an array, right? So it's no rocket science. But as you can see, you have like, lots of different options that you might choose from some. Sometimes you will um, use the query client when you do a mutation. So a mutation is basically this fact of deleting, let's say the entry, updating, creating the new one. So whenever you see that user's interaction could actually make the data that you have fetched before, make it uh, stale, make it incorrect, make it outdated, this is where, where mutations kicks in. And the mutation, well, you could just send an HTTP post put patch delete request, basically like directly. But when you run it as a mutation, the, the only purpose of the mutation is that you bind the mutation with the query. So whenever the mutation is done, like the delete uh, is, uh, has, uh, has succeeded, then you can interact with your query client uh, in a way that you either, you know, invalidate, refetch, remove the entry, or um, update it locally, whatever you want to, whatever you want to do with it. And that's basically it. So we've got the queries, we've got the mutation, 
Sometimes you also use the query client. And basically, these are the three building blocks or the three elements that you directly interact with. And there is, well, technically inside, there is way more things, but you don't need to care about them at all. So um, the data flow is that basically um, you will have components that will have the inject query statements, which basically define, hey, this component depends on this certain data. Of course, the query includes not only the query function, but also the query key, which is the identifier of a certain external uh, data resource. Um, so this is whenever you want to read the data. When you have... When you when you want to modify the data, like by modify I mean uh, create, uh, update, delete, so everything like all the crude except for read, uh, then this could become a mutation when there is a any kind of relation between your modification and any existing uh, cache entries, and that's basically that's basically it. And mutation allows you kind of to kind of bridge your change, the user's change, with how does this affect the the cache key. So that's basically it. Um, it could also be useful to to get, uh, get to know what the configuration is. So for instance, we have something that is called stale time, which I have already mentioned. And that is, for how long should a query, um, a query cache data be considered uh, up to date? So whenever stale time has passed, this query is considered stale, which you can, by the way, see perfectly clearly in um, the Angular query or React query DevTools. Um, when the data is stale, uh, the next time there is a new subscriber or the new kind of consumer component uh, comes in interested in the in the data, um, the query would be refetched. But there is also something that used to be called uh, cache time. Now it's called in uh, the core query version five, it's called uh, GC time, which stands for garbage collection. So um, you could think of it that the data could be fresh, it could be stale, but it also could uh, it also could be so outdated, so much outdated that it doesn't make sense to be shown to the user at all. So it's better to remove it entirely. <laughs> so it could be fresh, it could be fresh-ish, or it could be so outdated that basically you just drop it. <laughs> so um, this is, again, yet another uh, configuration option that you can use within configuring your, your queries. So I would say this is the, the one that you would be most often interested in. Yeah, but the flow is very simple. Like you've got queries, you've got mutations, and whenever you want to combine the two, You've got the query client, and and that's it. All query libraries have amazing dev tools. Could you let us know what the capabilities are? How do they help us in our work? We've got the core query dev tools, which are the same dev tools available in the React version, Angular version, Svelte version, and etc. So, query dev tools allow us to display what are the queries within our within our application. By this, I mean, what are the queries that have ever been activated, used, cached, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so for instance, uh, maybe, maybe let's compare it to what we've got in the uh, native DevTools network tab. So what you see in the network tab is basically how many requests, ACP requests, for instance, uh, you have sent and what were the responses that you have seen. So I would say this is the low level um, let's say, uh, way of, of, of low-level perspective. Like, what were the requests and what were the responses? The query DevTools, however, they denote what is the query status. So, for instance, if you have this api.com slash users query, so that would be a user query, basically, you would see that, okay, there was the users query. You would see a number showing how many components, how many active subscribers, like how many component consumers are there. Um, like you could see that there is one, basically one component needs to display the data. That could be zero. And that would mean that uh, some at some point in time, there was a component which was using them, but you have moved to a different tab, to a different view within your application. So the a query uh, the, the the query key 
uh, it is there in the cache still, but nobody is using it. And it has not been destroyed yet. But on the other hand, you could have, let's say, number three or five, denoting that basically three or five components respectively uh, do need the data. You would also see by the color and by the labels um, what is the status of the query. So whether it's fresh, whether it's stale, whether it's inactive, whether it's uh, load loading or erroring, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You could also, um, using the DevTools, you could trigger a certain state. For instance, if you have loaded the api.com slash users, then you could uh, click on it to manually refetch the query right here, right now. That's basically only for, you know, development or debugging uh, purposes, just to just to make it easier to interact with your page. Or you could trigger loading so that when you click within the DevTools, you can kind of, um, by force, you make the query enter the loading state because, for instance, you would like to see how does your component look when it is in the loading state? Then you could, you know, uh, like revoke, uh, like, you know, um, resume to the, to the success uh, state. Or you could also trigger to walk into, again, by force, into the error state so that you could see, okay, if something wrong happened with the, with the request, how would your uh, view behave? So, again... If you consider that a query is the dependency for components, yeah, which depends on some external data, the queries, uh, the query dev tools allow you to manipulate and interact with those queries. And again, they are shared across uh, your entire application. Of course, you would see a list of the queries by the query keys, by their identifiers. They are very simple and intuitive to work with, by the way. Apart from query, mutation is also an important concept. What is its responsibility, and does it have anything to do with queries? Um, yeah, so like I mentioned before, uh, a query is a declarative concept that we declare the dependency, and the mutation is a purely imperative concept because, um, w well, when would we, when should Angular query run a get request whenever the component uh, which requires the data uh, to, to, to have it to display it whenever this component gets basically rendered or displayed in the view so you don't need to do anything with it but for instance if you have the list of users and you click the delete button on any of the user in order to delete the object like when would you run the mutation because the delete would be a mutation um this is not declarative. You would basically run the mutation whenever the button click event has happened. So this is totally not um, not declarative. This is purely imperative. But again, um, I have mentioned before the query client, uh, which is basically kind of the public API that you can use to do something with your cache entries. And um, yeah, what, what does have mutation to do with the queries is that some mutations could affect some of the cache entries and you do this via the query client. And actually, whenever you work with uh, Angular query, React query, etc., what you should uh, focus on is like from, from your core perspective, is what you should focus on on the design perspective anyway, so that what are the resources that you need to load? What is the data that you need to have within your application? By the way, why does Angular Query share the data by default? Because somebody would say, hey, I would like different components to have different data. But come on, we are not speaking about local state. We are speaking about server state. So whenever you would like to display or any, anyhow consume the server state, then this is not your state. You have to load it from the external data. So why would you um, support two different components who would uh, independently fetch the same data, like if you fetch them from an external data source, they're going to be the same as long as they are uh, up to date. They're going to be the same anyway, so it doesn't make sense to keep copies. So, you know, it all makes perfect sense that if a mutation changes some resource that you have cached locally, then there should be just one cache entry because this is logical. So, yeah, the, the mutation is basically updating the queries in a way that 
whenever there is a relation between um, between what you change and what you have already loaded, then it should be uh, reflected. So uh, when designing an application, uh, uh, architecture, state management, etc., you should anyway um, design where do you keep the data, what do you share, what are the resources that you want to load, how do you modify them, what is the flow, what is the nature of updates and the changes of the data. And what Angular Query helps you is just make it explicit, make it organized, make it hierarchical, and that's and and basically define if there is any dependency between the changes and the updates, um, well, reflect it within your mutations and your uh, queries. So that's basically it. But having that said, um, this only applies to the server state, not the local state. Would you recommend any good practices for developers using Angular Query? Yeah, like I would first of all recommend people to take a look at Dominic Dorfmeister's blog. Uh, his uh, Twitter handle is TKDodo, uh, very active contributor uh, to React Query and maintainer. And Dominic has written lots of very, very good blog posts when it comes to, well, React Query. But actually, again, since this is basically a port of the same library just ported to Angular, all the, you know, good and bad patterns, uh, good and bad practices they apply to, like, they're framework agnostic. So one of my um, favorite uh, tips from Dominic is to create a query key factories so that whenever you have multiple components interested in displaying the same data, don't inline uh, the query keys within the components but define one place where you just have very simple functions which uh, return the query keys. And uh, just to remind, query keys is basically an array of strings. And this way you can, um, you can you know, whenever you invalidate or remove, you can invalidate or remove or update, etc. A single cache entry, but thanks to the fact that they are hierarchical, you can remove a whole bunch of queries that basically match the the let's say the the query key that you have that you have uh, sent and if you just define the query keys in one place you know and the all the components and the queries would basically reuse it it's going to be once um cleaner and second uh it's going to be basically easier to to maintain in the long run another thing is i would uh, suggest people not to put the query in the like the query uh content uh, in line in the component, like I mean, don't put inject query with the query function and query key, etc., within the component because that means that the component would have to know all the details of how to support the query, etc., etc. So what I mean is that it is the component who should be uh, who should have the query injected, not a service. We'll get back to it in just a while, but. Using the modern Angular API, which is uh, the inject function uh, as compared to constructor-based injection, you can basically write, for instance, a simple function, inject users, which returns, and, and this is basically a function that is um, created in just a file that is just near to the component, or it could be even better put somewhere in the API layer of your application because the query doesn't represent your component. It doesn't wrap a component. A query wraps the API that is being exposed to you, right? So whenever the API changes, your queries would change, right? So that's the thing. So I would put the queries just near the API and the inject users function would basically return the inject query with all the details. So this is not a service. This is basically a standalone function, just a one that is uh, allowed by the new um, inject Angular function, and the component would basically get the, the user's query equals inject users, and that's basically it. So that would be a one-liner. Um, why? Because whenever you open a component, well, in the long run, you don't want your components to have 200 lines of code, 300 lines of code, 500 lines of code. You would like to be able to take a look at your component from a very high level perspective. And now if you're interested in what the heck is user query or whatever that is, then you can basically uh, click 
to the certain file to see, okay, so this is the configuration of the query. If you see user's query, then you will know, okay, this is Angular query, right? But um, uh, most often, you don't want to see, whenever you open a component or a service, you don't want to see all the low-level details. You don't want to open a file that is, you know, 1,000 lines long. So basically, for the sake of encapsulation, just expose it as a one-liner if you and if you only you need to know the details basically walk into the uh, the file uh, another thing um why would i recommend to uh put the query on a component and not a service this is because how cleanup uh cleaning up works in angular and that is we have a whole hierarchy of injectors we have um the environment injectors and we have the uh, element injectors. So some of them are kind of global to the whole application, and some others are related to the elements of the uh, tree hierarchy of the components and directives. And if we put something in the service, most of the services that people come up with are services provided in root. So whenever you create such a, a query on a service that is provided in root, then Angular query would figure out that, hey, there is an active consumer of the query. And the thing is, there might be a service that already exists for some reason, but there is no component that would be actually interested in consuming the data from, from the service, from the query. So it is quite easy to walk into a situation where you eagerly start to load the data even though there might be no component interest in, in the data. So this is the risk. Now, what you could do, you could remove the provided in root section within the service definition and put, let's say, provided, provided null or basically remove the configuration object from the injectable uh, entirely and put the service in the local provider of a component. That would fix the issue because when the components gets created, only then the service instance gets created as well, and then your um, consumer, your active consumer would actively uh, be created as well. And uh, the same way, when the components get destroyed, the service would also get destroyed, and then React Query would find out, okay, we have one consumer less, so maybe we can uh, remove the query, uh, query, uh, query cache entry entirely if the time passes, right? But since most of the services are like what due to what I've according to what I've seen in the wild, most of services are available globally anyway. That's one thing. And another thing, the fact like whether whether you put your service globally or locally would depend uh, would affect very significantly what is the data flow and what is the life cycle and, and your lifetime of your you know requests and the amount of your requests. So I would say this would be a very um, unnecessary and unclear coupling between your services and their structures and the hierarchy of injectors and the HTTP request that you do. So I would say this would be a very unclear and unwanted, uh, unwanted coupling between two well, quite unrelated things. And for this reason, unless you really, really have to, I would say uh, put your queries on your components, not your uh, services, because this is really not worth it. So um, by the way, if you have this, uh, let's say api.com slash users um, uh, REST resource, and you provide one injectable inject uh, users query, um, somewhere inside your application, then you could have multiple components which basically use the same function and you don't have to put the thing in, on, on a service because the uh, Angular query uh, cache is going to share the data for you anyway, so you don't need a service here. You, you totally don't. So I would say um, keeping, like, uh, what are the good practices? Keep your keys at one place so that all the queries and all the mutations can basically reuse the keys. This is just as simple as this. This is going to be way easier to maintain and understand what are the keys and uh, easier to refactors, etc. And um, encapsulate your queries to uh, uh, separate injectable uh, functions that you can basically consume as one-liners thanks to Angular inject function. And the third thing is try to avoid 
queries put on services, uh, I would definitely keep them on the components by default, unless you have a very good reason to do it. But I would say like the whole point of service would be to share the data, but the cache is doing it for you anyway. So I see no, no reason to do it in a default situation. So these would be the recommendations from me. Tomasz, big thanks for joining Angular Master Podcast. Your expertise added so much. It was absolute pleasure having you and I'm looking forward for the possibility of welcoming you back in the future. Thank you very much, Darek. And thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.